Hello. In this two part video series, we are going to discuss a little bit about the HERG channel, HERG blockers, and how to avoid making them. The objectives of this talk are what is the HERG channel and its physiological function? Why blocking HERG is not a desirable off target effect in any drug candidate, and how drugs bind to HERG. The HERG is the acronym for Human Heteragogo-Related Gene. That name comes from genetic experiments in Drosophila, fluid fl flies. And in humans, it encodes a potassium voltage-dependent channel that is responsible for the IKR repolarizing current in the heart, this one here. It plays a really important role in the physiology of the heart, especially in what we call the QT interval, that is the distance in seconds between the Q and the T wave of electrocardiogram. Patients with mutations in the heart gene are correlated with what we call the long QT syndrome type 2, in which this QT interval is longer than normal, and that can cause a higher risk of ventricular arrhythmia or TDP, twisting of the points, and that can lead to sudden cardiac death. So this figure shows what would be electrocardiogram before the twisting of the points, during and as the TDP is going on. So that can give you an illustration on how serious the uh, digging with the HERC channel is. During the late 80s and early 90s, there was a growing body of evidence between the use of some drugs and long QT syndrome, especially for terfenagine and astemizol when used in higher than approved doses or co-administered with non-CIP inhibitors. Then the discovery of the human HERG gene and the expression in mammalian cells allow us to test if some drugs are HERG inhibitors. And then both drugs were found to be HERG blockers. As a consequence, astemizol was withdrawn voluntarily and FGA removed terfenogen's approval. Other drugs followed up, such as Cisabrite, Sertindol, Gripafloxacin, and Thioridazine. And as a final consequence, uh, HERG testing became mandatory prior to any clinical trials shortly thereafter, meaning that if you want authorization to test a drug in humans, you have to prove that your drug is not a HERG blocker. So the HERG channels, how they look like? So we can see here, we have the stop view. By the way, by top, we mean the extracellular medium. There are here four alpha subunits organizing themselves in order to form a pore in the middle. It, each alpha subunit can be further divided in two domains, what we call the voltage sensing domain in red or the pore domain in blue. So those S1 to S6, at, they are what we call the transmembrane domains. So they are, they are protein sequences that cross the membrane from the inside to the outside or the extracellular medium and back and forth in order to form this very complex protein. From the voltage sensing, sensing domain, the more relevant would be S4, here represented with a lot of positive symbols because the S4 uh, um, chain or that part of the voltage sensing domain is the part of the protein that will change or sense voltage changes in the membrane and cause the change of conformation in the pore domain, meaning that this is the part of the, the subunit that will cause either the HERG channel to be open or closed. So uh, the channel can exist in three forms or three states, what we call the closed, the open, in which then the potassium uh, cations are allowed to go from the 
intracellular to the extracellular medium, and also the inactivated uh, state. Important to remember that the high affinity herd blockers, or the majority of them, they will bind to the open or the inactivated forms of the channel, in a way that meaning that they need to permeate through the membrane, get inside the extracellular medium, and then enter the herd channel from the inside. So binding to certain amino acids in the pore domain, causing them to either stabilize or to block um, the passage, passage of potassium cations, cations or to super stabilize the inactivated form of the channel. Also, if you take a, a, a even closer look, in green or greenish color, we have the voltage sensor, sensor domain, VSG, and in yellow, we have the pore domain. We can see here two regions that we call the SF, or the selectivity filter, and the central cavity. So, the selectivity filter is composed of a series of amino acids. We, you can see here the oxygen from the carbonyl groups of those amino acids. That selectivity filter enables the herc channel to selectively allow potassium cations from the intracellular medium all the way to the extracellular medium. Another part of the channel that is important is the central cavity, because here we find the binding site for most of the known herc blockers. It's larger than other potassium channels, and the main amino acid residues involved in the binding with the known herc blockers would be tyrosine, phenylalanine, and also a threonine and a serine uh, residues that might also participate in the binding. Taking a closer look at the central cavity, that is the binding site for the most of the known herc blockers, we can see that it's highly inspecific or promiscuous. For example, a high throughput screening assay with more than 300,000 compounds found that nearly one third of them would block the channel somehow at a fixed concentration of trend micromolar. And also, if you look at the Campbell database in which you can filter compounds per activity, so you can choose, okay, show me all the compounds that inhibit HERG. There are nowadays 9,000 compounds with IC50 equal or below to 10 micromolar reg registered in the Campbell that database. That is a very, very high number, by the way. So in a sense, or at a glance, a larger cavity size and several possibilities of binding modes means that this uh, HERG central cavity can accommodate several different uh, blockers and that is a problem because blocking the herc channel is something that we don't want a molecule to present as a property and by the way how do we can find if a molecule is a herc blocker for example one of the tests that we can do is the q patch um, HERC, that is an in vitro assay, that is an automated test. In that test, we can measure the electrical current or the voltage around a membrane or a cell using a micropipette. And we use our cells, cancer cell lines, transfected with stable HERC channels using a known HERC blocker, a very potent HERC blocker, by the way, and the MSO solution as a negative control. And then we use multiple doses of our HERC blocker in order to uh, determine the IC50 for that possible blocker. That test can cost up to some hundred pounds per compound, meaning that is a test that is somehow expensive to perform meaning that we don't test molecules for HERG blockers in the early stages of drug discovery. Normally, we do that when we approach the lead optimization phase. So, the fact that the central cavity is larger than other potassium channels and presents several amino acids that can interact with those blockers means that we have multiple binding modes and multiple pharmacophoric models for HERC blockers. I will present here in this video four of them 
for the sake of clarity. But if you are really interested in knowing the other binding modes and other pharmacophoric models, I can recommend you to this review here on the reference here below in the screen. So we have two binding modes that can be further uh, subclassified, but one of them is the parallel mode in which the blocker is binding to the central cavity in a way that is parallel to the selectivity filter. By the way, in this um, uh, computer generated image, those purple spheres here are the potassium uh, cations that are passing through the selectivity filter on its way out of the cell. So in the binding mode one, we have a positively charged uh, functional group, normally an amine, an aromatic ring, and another hydrophobic moiety. The positively charged group is interacting with a tyrosine residue during a cation pi interaction. The phenylalanine that is also highlighted here is doing hydrophobic interactions with the hydrophobic moiety of the molecule. And also we have the other parallel binding mode that is called the alternate hypothesis, in which our positively charged amine is doing a cation dipole interactions with the threonine residue. We have a pi pi stacking interaction happening with the same tyrosine residue from the other binding mode that we presented earlier. And phenylalanine is doing hydrophobic interactions with the hydrophobic moiety. We also have two other modes that we call the perpendicular ones. So the first one it would be the, from the perpendicular hypothesis. Also, we have a basic center, charged, an aromatic ring, and another hydrophobic moiety. In this mode, phenylalanine is interacting with the hydrophobic moiety. Tyrosine, tyrosine is doing or making hydrophobic interactions with the aromatic ring and polar residues are doing polar interactions with the basic center. Those are all highlighted here. The fourth, the fourth and last binding mode, we have the positively charged center interaction with a carbonyl group from a threonine or serine. We also have tyrosine doing hydrophobic interactions with the aromatic ring and phenylalanes alanine residues doing hydrophobic interactions with this hydrophobic moiety here. So now I'm going to ask you a question regarding astemizole. The structure of astemizole is shown here. Also, we have the 3G uh, molecule in a molecular docking with the HERG channel, highlighting here the selectivity filter, and here highlighting the possible interactions that this astemizole is doing. So what I am going to ask you is for you to take some time and think about from those binding modes, the parallel and the perpendicular, what do you think? Which binding mode is this? So hit the pause button, think a little bit. I'm going to wait So if you thought about the perpendicular mode, because the molecule is in a perpendicular shape or fashion regarding the selectivity filter, you're right. Very good. Concerning the pharmacophoric models, we have four, more than four distinct pharmacophoric models for this uh, receptor. Again, if you are interested in knowing all of them, I will recommend you to this review. But here in this video, I'm going to discuss four of those pharmacophoric models. At a glance, what we have in the four of them. We have a basic group in the majority of them, the first three ones, surrounded by hydrophobic groups that can be either aromatic rings or other hydrophobic groups. Also, we have another model in which we have one aromatic ring surrounded by three hydrogen bond acceptors and one hydrogen bond donors. 
Again, I'm going to ask you to take a little pause and think about, okay, based on those uh, pharmacophoric uh, models, uh, which pharmacophoric model that I shown in the previous slide would be the best to fit those Herc blockers? I'm going to add those pharmacophoric models over here and give you some time to think about. I will be right back. So, were you able to come up with an answer? Okay, let us go molecule by molecule. So, astanizol will fit the model in which you have a basic center here, that is nitrogen, surrounded by aromatic rings. Grepafloxacin fits the model in which you have an aromatic ring over here, surrounded by hydrogen bond acceptors and a donor. Cisapride also fits the model in which we have a basic center with aromatic rings surrounding it. Otherwise, there are no three, there are not three rings, only two, but it also fits the model quite well. And thioridazine is the model in which we have the basic group over here surrounded by hydrophobic moieties. Very well, very well. So thank you very much for watching this video. In the next video of the series, we are going to discuss, okay, now that we know how the heart blockers bind to the heart channel, how can we design molecules to avoid these bindings to happen? So I see you on the second and last part of this video series. Bye.